basalt lava with 50-foot cracks. First day of filming our geology videos? Had a little problem. Top of a column, top of a column, top of a column. Hello. Beautiful oh. show. Oh, <laughs> we'll be back with a big bag. <laughs> My hammer, still at the bottom. Tom and I had to come back the next weekend with another hammer to finish the episode. Two Minute Geology. Hi, this is Nick Sentner in Ellensburg, Washington. This is a video remembering Tom Foster, the creator of Two Minute Geology and a close collaborator almost eight years ago now. Tom was a very talented person. Nobody worked harder, and we miss him. Tom passed away unexpectedly on March 4th of 2020, and here we are at the end of 2020, thinking back on all the things that have happened in this uh, terrible year. Uh, but for me, uh, losing Tom was at the top of the list. And not just me, of course, his extended family and friends, co-workers. I'd like to share with you the two-minute geology videos that Tom and I created starting back in 2012. And we were really at the uh, height of our game uh, in 2013. We were hiking almost every weekend together, lugging all the camera equipment, the video camera equipment, the audio materials, sometimes we'd actually have ladders we'd be carrying out. It's just two guys out there on the weekends for fun. There was no official um, relationship. And Tom created all of these programs that you'll see um, by himself in his kitchen, self-taught with geology, self-taught with the video camera, self-taught with the editing stuff, just amazing abilities. And he and I saw the power and the wonder of geology very similarly. And I learned so much from Tom as we were out there talking and working and thinking. And so, warning, you're going to see mostly me on camera, but I want you to think about Tom uh, behind the scenes, and I want you to enjoy all of Tom's photos that he put into the programs. And I found on my computer the last few days all the old clips that were not used because Tom was such a perfectionist. And so you'll see things that have never been aired before as well. Tom, we miss you, we love you, and here's Two Minute Geology with Tom Foster. Two Minute Geology, the Two Minute Geology. Hello, young people. Columnar Basalt. Hiking today near Othello, Washington. Look at these columns. They're perfect. And 50 feet high. These columns are found in a rock called basalt, which is a lava flow rock. We have them all over eastern Washington, but we can also find columns like this, Devil's Tower in Wyoming, Giant's Causeway in Ireland. We've even found columnar basalt on Mars. Here in eastern Washington, the Ice Age floods came barreling through this country thousands of years ago, ripping up a lot of bedrock and exposing these columns. And to figure out why the columns form, how about we actually climb to the top of these columns, walk around up there, see if we can't figure things out. Come on, let's get up there. Each of these is a column. We're up on top of them now. These cracks are 50 feet deep. And these cracks with this beautiful pattern are found all through nature. You go to a drying mud puddle after a thunderstorm and you see cracks like this. You go to the Arctic and you see permafrost with cracks in these shapes. These lavas cooled 10.5 million years ago 
when the lava came in at 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit and probably cooled over the course of a century. 100 years of cooling, these cracks got established back then. As the lava was cooling, contracting, surfaces shrinking, and the net result, columnar basalt near Othello, Washington. It's all out here to see Coolies, rocks, and canyons is scenery Right here for you and me Two Minute Geology Ah, but there's more than one pothole. There's dozens of them down here on that bench. Swarms of them, just like these insects that are here. Here's the pothole we were just at. Here's the pothole we were just at, more than 50 feet across, 50 feet deep. Bunch of the other potholes about the same dimensions. Think of the power necessary for that. As the potholes enlarged, they started merging, coalescing, to form channels in some cases along the floor of the coulee. These are the potholes just west of Deep Lake, but there's other potholes up by Castle Lake. There's more potholes down by Lake Lenore. They're all part of the same layer. They've all been drilled into the top of a very stubborn Grand Ronde basalt flow. Power, extraordinary power needed to get into this particular basalt. Ice Age floods potholes just south of Cooley City, Washington. Two minute geology, the two minute geology. Hello, young people. Petrified wood out hiking today near Vantage, Washington, in the Ginkgo Petrified Forest State Park. There's a petrified tree right there, still standing. Fifteen and a half million year old tree been standing here for that long, it was petrified underneath a lava flow that was 15 and a half million years old. The lava flow has been taken away by the Ice Age floods, and this stubborn tree held its ground. When you come out here and look, it's a desert landscape. We get less than 10 inches of rain a year. But when these trees were alive, this was a dense forest studying the kinds of wood that's out here, the petrified wood. We know we have a variety of trees that were dominating in this area. Those kinds of forests today only survive in places that have 50 inches of rain a year. I'm talking about the forests of southeast United States or eastern Asia. The ginkgo trees are rare, however. More than 50% of the trees are either Douglas fir or spruce. To understand how the petrification process took place to turn these trees to stone, let's take a closer look at some of these logs. We're at the museum at Ginkgo State Park. We've got petrified logs laying on the ground here for visitors to enjoy. It's petrified. These are logs made out of stone. And they were pulled right out of basalt lava in the hills. Logs right in the lava. Why didn't the logs just burn up from the heat of the lava? They survived because there was water present. The logs were pulled out of the pillow zone at the base of a lava flow, which tells us that water dominated this landscape. The lake water protected the logs from the heat of the lava. And there was so much lava that we sealed off those logs from the atmosphere so we didn't rot the logs with oxygen. We had the right ingredients then for petrification. A lot of water, a lot of heat, and minerals, silica, from the overlying basalt lava. The hot water allowed for transfer of the silica into the wood, soaked into the wood and exquisitely preserved 
the cell structure of these logs. We can then identify the different kinds of wood, the different kinds of trees, based on the patterns of these cell structures. Petrified logs, advantage Washington. It's all out here to see. Coolies, rocks, and canyons is scenery. Right here for you and me. Two minute geology. Dad, go over and kill that rooster, would you please? Strangle it with your bare hands. Hello, young people. The Wallula Gap near the little town of Wallula, Washington. Bodies of water ponded up upstream of the gap. Let's get a little closer and look at specific flood pathways. Bad way to end, otherwise I liked it. Going another one. Hello, young people. Wallula Gap, near the little town of Wallula, Washington. Let's look for evidence of that up high, on the West Bluff, 800 feet above the Columbia River. One more? Yeah. Hello, young people. Wallula Gap. Let's climb up on the gap itself overlooking it and look for evidence of water passing through this famous place. Why don't you say, well, let's climb up to the rim or the bluff instead of the gate. Okay. Just the last part? Yeah, of... just... That's an 800 foot bluff over there. Let's get up on top and look at the details of Ice Age floods water passing through this region. high and look for specific evidence of the Ice Age floods coming through this region, okay? Print it! Hello, young people. Two-minute geology, the two-minute geology. Hello, young people. Pillow lavas, just south of Vantage, Washington. Columbia River basalts here, each flow averaging 100 feet thick. And most of these lavas are dark colored from the top to the bottom of the lava flow. But this guy is orange at the bottom, you see that? A full one third of the basal section of the lava is orange, with dark colored circles, kind of like bowling balls. Those are the pillow lavas. Pillows tell us that water was present. A large lake was here 15 million years ago between eruptions of lava. We know that because in Hawaii, underwater, we've seen lava there flow into fingers. The lava splits into these worm-like structures as it goes out into the Pacific Ocean. So these aren't bowling balls at all. They're cross-sections of worm-like structures with the lava going out into this lake in central Washington. The orange area under the lake water, the dark colored stuff above the level of that ancient lake. Okay, time for some detail pillow, beautiful edge of a pillow, crumbly orange pelagonite over to another pillow. This is broken, fragile stuff, angular pieces of lava, some of them actually volcanic glass or obsidian, all through this orange crumbly pelagonite. There's drama recorded right here. This is hot lava, right? 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit, flowing into water that has a much lower temperature. Hot versus cold means bust up that rock. Petrified logs have been collected simply in this pelagonite, pulled right out of this zone between pillows themselves. And the location of pillow basalt all through central Washington helps us understand where ancient lakes and streams used to be. Pillow Basalt in central Washington. 
It's all out here to see Coolies, rocks and canyons is scenery Right here for you and me Two minute geology Top of a column, top of a column, top of a column. Hello. Beautiful oh. show. Oh, shit. <laughs> we'll be back with a big bag. <laughs> we didn't plan that. Two minute geology. The two minute geology. Hello, young people. Entrenched Meander, this is the Yakima River just south of Ellensburg, Washington. Meanders are a feature of old age, these sweeping curves of the river. As rivers age, they develop more and more exaggerated meanders. We know this by flying over the Mississippi River system. And we see all stages of meander development back there. Eventually, the meander becomes so exaggerated that that curve is abandoned and an oxbow lake is formed and the channel becomes straight again. We can only develop these curves when an area is flat, like back east at the Mississippi. And here we've got these exaggerated curves as well, which means central Washington used to be flat. But there's a twist. This place isn't flat anymore. This is a deep canyon system. So to understand that twist, how about we get up on that rim and get a big picture view of the Yakima River Canyon? Let's go up there. High up above the Yakima River, on the rim of the canyon looking down, there's one of our meanders. We know about meanders. The meanders got established when the area was flat, a subtle curve becoming a more exaggerated curve. But then we froze the position of this meander and we entrenched it. Entrenched meanders tell us that the land is lifting against the river. The river wasn't up here and was cut down. We're sure that the river has been down there for millions of years. And the land has been lifting against the meander, against the river. The river's been cutting, matching an uplift rate of the bedrock, basalt layer after basalt layer, exposing themselves on the way up. The future of this meander is not more exaggerated meander, development of an oxbow lake. Instead, the future of this curve is more cutting because the uplift continues here in central Washington. Entrenched meanders, just south of Ellensburg, Washington. It's all out here to see Coolies, rocks and canyons is scenery Right here for you and me Two Minute Geology okay. Hello young people Restoration Point on the south tip of Bainbridge Island A famous place for us to look at specific evidence, digging a little deeper and looking at the evidence for the Seattle Fault earthquake 1100 years ago, about the year 900 AD. You're looking east, right down the guts of the Seattle Fault. Two minute geology, the two minute geology. Hello young people, the Ice Age floods at Wenatchee, Washington, the Columbia River and the foothills of the Cascades. There's a great Ice Age floods geology story here, and the Columbia River is part of it. Mainly deposits, though. We're not talking about ripping up the ground by the floods here. We're talking about depositing material out of the Ice Age flood water. Upstream from Wenatchee, the Okanagan Glacier, an ice sheet came down from Canada and blocked the Columbia, sending water into the Grand Coulee and over Dry Falls, and protecting Wenatchee from the power of these Ice Age floods. But there were times during the Ice Age that the Okanagan was not there. 
and the Ice Age floods could come all the way down the Columbia River, around the Horn, and down over the city of Wenatchee. 65 mile an hour water, a thousand feet deep. There's more to the story than that. The Columbia Valley is narrow upstream from Wenatchee, cut into stubborn metamorphic rock called gneiss. There's also a narrow Columbia Valley downstream from Wenatchee, cut into basalt. But here at Wenatchee, the, the, the basin is open, it's broad. So the Ice Age floodwaters coming down the Columbia slowed here, filled this basin, and waited their turn to exit south through the narrow canyon. That means that we had water creeping up neighboring valleys, as well as depositing truly giant flood bars, the most famous of which is Pangborn Bar deposited on the inside curve of the Ice Age floods. A pile of rock 600 feet high. The high water mark above Pangborn Bar, 1,700 feet in elevation. That means we had so much water here that the water started to slowly creep up to the west, the Wenatchee River Valley. Quiet slack water over Kashmir. Dryden, Peshastan, Ice Age flood water getting all the way up into the Cascades as far as Leavenworth. Have you heard this before? Heck, there's ice at this time up at Leavenworth coming out of the icicle drainage, and yet we've got Ice Age flood water lapping up against that glacier? That's quite a story. What evidence do we have for that? We've used Ice Age flood erratics and rhythmites to reconstruct this part of the story. Erratics light-colored boulders scattered on the hillsides here in the Wenatchee River Valley. Up to 300 feet above the river are those boulders. Up to 600 feet above the river here at Wenatchee, we've got these ice-rafted erratics. Telling us where the high water mark was of this quiet bathtub water working its way up the Wenatchee River. In fact, all the beautiful orchards that are in the floor of the Wenatchee Valley are on Ice Age flood deposits. Those are the rhythmites, fine-grained, chalky sedimentary material deposited at the bottom of this Ice Age water. Each rhythmite, talking about an individual flood event, and maybe not all of the water surging up the Wenatchee River Valley is coming from the north. Moses Cooley's not very far away. And there was a big, broad, giant flood bar that sealed off the mouth of Moses Cooley that trapped water and sent more slack water upstream and into the Wenatchee area. The Ice Age floods at Wenatchee, Washington. It's all out here to see Coolies, rocks, and canyons is scenery Right here for you and me Two Minute Geology Two-minute geology, the two-minute geology. Hello, young people. Ice rafted erratics near Mattawa, Washington. Erratics, boulders that do not match the local bedrock. The local bedrock here in central Washington is brown layers of basalt, lava rock, and yet we've got these big light-colored boulders, granites and metamorphic rocks that dot the landscape. How did they get here? Erratics are usually associated with glaciers, ice sheets, bringing these boulders to an area. But here at Mattawa, we are 60 miles south of where the ice sheet used to be in north central Washington, north of Wenatchee. So this is not from glacial activity. This is from Ice Age floods, ripping off pieces of that ice sheet and carrying 
these boulders down here, ice rafted erratics. Let's go a little further south in the Pasco Basin and look for more of these guys, okay? How about this beauty? We're on the lower slopes of Rattlesnake Mountain near Benton City, Washington. This is argillite, a metamorphic rock that used to be shale. 1.5 billion years old. This thing's like 12 feet long, it's angular. The Ice Age floods brought this boulder here. This is Rocky Mountain geology brought to South Central Washington. Rafts of ice, icebergs floating in the water, carrying boulders like these. And this guy either fell off of its ice raft, or the iceberg got into some quiet water, stranded, melted, and left the rock. Regardless, this boulder's been sitting here for at least 13,000 years. Ice rafted erratics in South Central Washington. It's all out here to see. Coolies, rocks, and canyons is scenery. Come along with me. Two minute geology. Two minute geology. The two minute geology. Hello, young people. The Palouse River Canyon just south of Washtuckna, Washington. Welcome to Palouse Falls State Park. The crown jewel, the Palouse Falls itself. A 180 foot cliff with the Palouse River cascading over basalt bedrock. It's a beautiful place, especially in spring. But even in winter, during a cold snap, you get much of this water locked in ice. Equally impressive. But we're here for more than the waterfall. We're here to talk about the River Canyon itself, the most interesting canyons you'll find anywhere. The upper stretch of the canyon above the falls is perfectly straight, arrow straight, four mile stretch. Here by the falls, the canyon zigzags back and forth. And in the lower stretch, there's a more classic look to a coulee system with majestic buttes popping up from the canyon floor. And caves have been found with evidence of human history going back 10,000 years. People have been enjoying this place for a long, long time. Geologically, this canyon is not much older than 10,000 years. During the Ice Age, this canyon was not here. The waterfall was not here. The river wasn't even here. To tell the story of how this canyon formed, let's go upstream. The peaceful Palouse River, a few miles north of Palouse Falls. That's the road to Pullman in the distance there. Before the Ice Age floods, the Palouse River used to flow parallel to the Snake River. And a divide, a ridge, separated the two V-shaped river valleys. The ridge was composed of fractured basalt bedrock, mantled with wind-blown silt known as Luss. Cue the Ice Age floods, coming from Montana cruising through northern Idaho and barreling down into this tranquil scene. Way too much water for this valley to handle and the Ice Age floods easily overtopped the ridge and dumped directly into the Snake River. The erosive power of that flood water did serious damage to the ridge in multiple places. What's now known as Palouse River Canyon, the H.U. Ranch Coulee and Devil's Canyon. They're parallel cuts deeply into the basalt bedrock. It wasn't just the loose taken away, it was all the bedrock taken away as well. Deep fractures that are parallel to each other controlled where the floods did the most damage, like taking a fire hose to the ridge and etching out those deep fractures. The fractures formed originally 50 million years ago in response to crustal compression from the south and a lateral torquing as well. The Palouse River took advantage of this. In the old days, the Palouse River continued down its river north of the ridge. That's now known as Washtuckna Coulee, and that coulee's dry, no river it anymore. Instead, the Palouse River took advantage of the deepest cut, 
took a left turn, a south turn into the ridge, and now forms the Palouse River Canyon. So we've got our answer, right? The Ice Age floods cut this canyon, not the Palouse River. When the floods got the floor of this canyon lower than Washtucna Coulee, the Palouse River permanently came in here and left its old valley high and dry. The Snake River effectively captured the Palouse River, something we call stream capture. Today, Palouse Falls is impressive. A drop of 180 feet, in fact, there was a world record for a kayak drop recently. But back during Ice Age floods time, fill the entire canyon with water. Brown, raging, dirty water coming through, thundering through this canyon with the original position of the Ice Age waterfall down at the Snake River and through flooding had the lip of that waterfall migrate back five miles to its present position. The power of the Ice Age floods in the Palouse River Canyon south of Washtucna, Washington. It's all out here to see Coolies, rocks, and canyons is scenery Right here for you and me Two Minute Geology Two Minute Geology Geology. Hello young people, the Seattle Fault running right beneath downtown Seattle. Have you heard about this? We've got a major fault right beneath our biggest city. Issaquah, I-90, downtown Seattle where I'm standing next to the freeway, underneath Puget Sound, Bainbridge Island and beyond. It's kind of bad luck that we found this major fault underneath our biggest city. First suspected in 1965, dated and confirmed in 1992. Okay, so it's a big crack. Should we be worried about it? Actually, we should. Faults are related to earthquakes, and we have excellent evidence for a magnitude 7 or greater earthquake on this fault 1,100 years ago, the year 900 AD. Intense ground shaking and a tsunami generated in the Puget Sound, flowing north 30 miles up to Everett, Washington. And are we concerned about the future? We are. There is great concern among scientists, engineers, and emergency planners for the future of earthquakes on the Seattle Fault. You can best find the fault on Bainbridge Island across the water from downtown Seattle. Take the ferry out to Winslow and you'll find Restoration Point, a raised platform above the water of the Puget Sound. George Vancouver back in 1792 was the first guy to notice it. Geologists now know that that raised platform came up during the earthquake. 21 feet of sudden, abrupt uplift south of the fault, not only Restoration Point, but Alki Point, came up suddenly during the earthquake. The quake happened in response to crustal compression squeezing of the crust due to plate tectonic forces. Northern California is inching northward towards Canada every year, and the Northwest here is getting pinched. We're getting squeezed. Those forces continue. That's why we think more earthquakes are coming on these shallow crustal faults like the Seattle Fault. And our current estimate is that there's a 5% chance in the next 50 years of a big earthquake on the Seattle Fault, magnitude 6.5 or higher. We're learning more and more about our faults, dates of prehistoric earthquakes. It's a golden age for research. But I don't mean to bum you out. This is a beautiful city. We just need to be prepared for the next big earthquake in the Puget Sound. Emergency planners from the state of Washington have excellent resources online. And you and I just need to make sure that we are prepared. The goal, 72 hours of self-sufficiency after the next big earthquake. We can do it on the Seattle Fault. 
just beneath Seattle, Washington. It's all out here to see Coolies, rocks, and canyons is scenery Right here for you and me Two Minute Geology Two Minute Geology The Two Minute Geology Hello young people the Columbia River basalts near Quincy, Washington. We're at Quincy, Washington, but we could pick any spot between Spokane, Washington and Seaside, Oregon to do this show. These brown layers of basalt are everywhere in the place where the Ice Age floods did massive amounts of erosion thousands of years ago. There's more than 300 layers of basalt here, 300 separate volcanic eruptions and the stack of basalt is more than two miles thick in places. The lavas started erupting 17 million years ago here and flooded a landscape, buried a landscape in lava. The obvious question is, which volcano erupted? Was it Mount Rainier, Mount St. Helens? The answer is none of those. The Cascade volcanoes do not match the chemistry of these basalt lavas. These are lavas that came from the east. They erupted out of fissures, deep cracks, that emitted Hawaiian-like lava starting 17 million years ago. Fissures that formed related to the birth of a hotspot that's now underneath Yellowstone National Park in Wyoming. The present is the key to the past. To really visualize eastern Washington 17 million years ago, we need to go to Hawaii today. Those Hawaiian lavas today are the same kinds of lavas that we have here. Lava flows in Hawaii, very fluid. The, the most fluid lavas we have in nature average less than three feet thick. Here in eastern Washington, the lava flows average 100 feet thick. In Hawaii, the lavas travel on average three miles in length. Here in eastern Washington, many of the lava flows traveled 300 miles. And in Hawaii, 30 miles are covered by a typical flow. Here in eastern Washington, 30,000 square miles of area buried. The Columbia River basalts near Quincy, Washington. It's all out here to see Coolies, rocks, and canyons is scenery Right here for you and me Two Minute Geology Two Minute Geology The Two Minute Geology Hello, young people. The White Bluffs, just north of Richland, Washington. Welcome to the Hanford Reach National Monument, the last free-flowing stretch of the Columbia River. The White Bluffs are on the east side of the river, 300 feet of soft sedimentary layers, and another 200 feet of that sediment below river level, and below that, more than two miles of lava rock, the Columbia River basalt flows. On the other side of the river here is the Hanford site. Back in 1943, restricted due to the top secret Manhattan Project. Since 2000, this side of the river has been opened up and available for recreation. Here on this side of the river, the White Bluffs are composed of the Ringgold Formation a series of sedimentary layers deposited between eight and three million years ago. This is back during a time when the ancestral Snake and Columbia rivers were bringing sediment into this area, sluggish streams eventually becoming broad lake deposits. And there's a rich fossil record in the Ringgold Formation, prehistoric animals including horses and camels.
So the main lesson from the Ringgold Formation, a series of sluggish streams developing then into a lake system. That was earlier than three million years ago, but there is a small section of the White Bluffs that looks very different. These sediments are rhythmically deposited. They're Ice Age flood deposits that were deposited in a pre-existing channel that was cut into the Ringgold. This is Lake Lewis time during the Ice Age floods, just a few thousand years ago, not millions of years ago. On the surface of the White Bluffs, you'd probably be surprised at how many exotic rocks are littering the surface. Those are ice rafted erratics. It's even more evidence of the Ice Age flood sweeping down into Lake Lewis, which existed in the Pasco Basin. The White Bluffs just north of Richland, Washington. It's all out here to see. Coolies, rocks, and canyons is scenery. Right here for you and me. Two minute geology. Two minute geology. The two minute geology. Hello, young people. Giant current ripples near Trinidad, Washington. The Columbia River, across the river, West Bar, a gravel bar. Bunch of rocks next to the river. What's the big excitement? The surface of West Bar is very unusual. It's kind of like something you've seen many times before. We've all seen these at the beach, right? Active current ripples. The wind blowing over the surface, transporting and depositing this fine sand in individual crests. It takes some pretty fancy math to explain that, but they're here. Each ripple a quarter of an inch high and three inches from crest to crest. So those were dunes made out of fine sand. These are current ripples made out of rocks, up to five foot boulders on West Bar. This is not wind making these ripples. You need a lot of water moving quickly. The Ice Age flood, that's why this is an important site to us. Studying these giant current ripples helps us reconstruct the speed and the depth of the Ice Age flood water. Each ripple is more than 20 feet high. The spacing between these giant current ripples, more than 100 yards, 360 feet from ridge to ridge. The water here was traveling more than 65 miles per hour. The water depth was higher than where I'm standing right now, coming over this scene. And it's not just here at West Bar. We have giant current ripples all through the Northwest, more than a hundred separate sites. And giant current ripples at Camas Prairie, first discovered by Joseph Pardee in Montana, proves a sudden release of the water of glacial Lake Missoula. It's all out here to see. Coolies, rocks, and canyons is scenery. Right here for you and me. Two minute geology. Two minute geology. The two minute geology. Hello, young people. Coolies. What is a coolie? Coolies are very unusual valleys. Their shapes are unusual. Valleys around the world are V shaped with rivers carving slowly through time. U-shaped valleys around the world, alpine glacial ice flowing out of mountains and carving the landscape. But these coolies are very different. They are box-shaped valleys with flat valley floors, vertical walls, and no rivers flowing through the bottom of the valleys. Ice Age floods between 28,000 and 14,000 years ago took lots of bedrock away, 
leaving these box-shaped valleys known as coolies. There's a lot of rock missing here. That's the coolie. Did the Ice Age floods really take all that rock away? They did. The bedrock is the key. So why did the Ice Age floods dig into the bedrock and haul so much rock away? Why didn't the water just skim over the top of the bedrock? The answer is looking at the structure in the bedrock. You see this climber right over here? This guy's climbing right up a beautiful column with cracks between the columns. This is basalt, a lava flow rock that came in one lava flow at a time. And when the lava cooled, it cracked vertical fractures and horizontal fractures. Some layers more stubborn to erosion than others. So let's bring the Ice Age floods in. Pick up columns one by one, haul them off. The bedrock is pre-cut and ready to be hauled off by the floods. Coolies of Central Washington. It's all out here to see. Coolies, rocks, and canyons is scenery. Right here for you and me. Two minute geology. Two minute geology. The two minute geology. Hello, young people. Luce Hills, just south of Hooper, Washington. This is the Palouse a series of rolling wheat fields, winter wheat. And the hills are made out of loess, silt, kitchen flour, wind-blown silt. Before the Ice Age, this is what Eastern Washington looked like. All of Eastern Washington, stretching from the Cascades clear over to the Rocky Mountains. Nothing but this, 250 feet of loess on top of Columbia River basalt bedrock. But we've got big areas of eastern Washington that don't have these hills anymore. What happened? So here's one of many places that's exciting because the Luce Hills are gone. Luce Hill, graceful contour, boom. Gone, we drop right down to the basalt floor and there's some remnants of Los Hills there in the distance. The Ice Age floods came through here, took the Los away. The high energy water picking the Los Hills up easily. The water was probably brown with all this silt. And then the soil here was redeposited further downstream where the water slowed down. Most famously in the Willamette Valley of Western Oregon. Good agricultural down there because they got our soil. It used to be up here. And in the flood pass, we've got remnants of the Luce Hills that have been streamlined. Flood waters over the top and around the sides of those hills with these long, graceful tails downstream. Those streamlined hills are aligned with the path of the flood water like salmon holding their position with their heads upstream as the water's coursing over them. Loose Hills, just south of Hooper, Washington. It's all out here to see. Coolies, rocks, and canyons is scenery. Right here for you and me. Two minute geology. Two minute geology. Two-minute geology. Hello, young people. Giant flood bars just north of Starbuck, Washington. Flood bars are piles of river rocks deposited by rivers. The rocks are carried by the river and then dropped out when the water is quiet. This is the Snake River, and on the inside of both of these curves, giant flood bars are right on the edge of the river. How do you pile gravel 200 feet above the river? Did the Snake River pile this gravel up that high? 
or is something else going on here? Okay, well, let's think about this. In river channels, where is the slow water? On the sides of a channel, on the inside of curves. And when rivers slow down as they enter a broad valley, flood bars form in those quiet spots. You've walked along a river. You know what the rocks look like in flood bars. The bigger the flood, the bigger the rocks. Giant flood bars mean giant floods, the Ice Age floods. Those giant flood bars next to the Snake River, Snake River didn't make those. The Ice Age floods created those. The giant flood bars are all through the Ice Age flood region. Let's kick it up a notch. I'm standing on a giant flood bar 600 feet above the Columbia River and the city of Wenatchee. This is Pangborn Bar. Four miles long, two miles wide on the inside curve of the Columbia River and the Ice Age flood water was above my head and I'm 600 feet above the river. Evidence of the Ice Age floods coming down the Columbia River, down the Snake River, and get away from these rivers and you'll find more giant flood bars in dry coolies and channels that once had Ice Age floods barreling through them. Giant flood bars, some of the most impressive features left by the Ice Age floods. It's all out here to see Coolies, rocks, and canyons is scenery Right here for you and me Two Minute Geology Hello young people, Ice Age Waterfalls. This is Dry Falls in North Central Washington, one of the most famous places that we've had Ice Age Waterfalls. Heavily visited the year round by travelers through the state. Everybody loves a waterfall. And this is a dry waterfall system and we're sure we had waterfalls here during the Ice Age time because that cliff over there, a 350 foot cliff, is curved. In fact, there's a whole series of curved cliffs at the maximum 10 miles wide, a complex of curved cliffs with lakes at the bottom and importantly, a large lower Grand Coulee system extending to the south here. We're focusing on these waterfalls because they play a large role in developing coulees during the Ice Age time. The rock in the cliffs is made out of basalt, a heavily fractured lava flow rock. And realizing that helps us put two and two together and realize that these rims of the waterfalls are going to be constantly on the move. There is a connection between Ice Age Flood's waterfalls and coulees. That waterfall, that curved cliff, hasn't always been there. Originally, it was 15 miles further south, and there was no coulee here. Coulees are places where the waterfalls take rock away. As the waterfall rim starts marching northward or retreating upflow, coolies develop in the void downstream. In fact, this waterfall used to be right here, pounding water right where I'm sitting. The waterfall rim migrated, the coulee lengthened. Ice Age floods waterfalls, dry falls, Washington.
And you, I think you got to say that, like much of it settled out. The way you've said it is that it all. Right. Right. Because a lot of the stories, how much stills washed out. Right. So it wouldn't just be all inclusive on that. Okay. We're just sitting there, nothing else doing, out of the wind. Nice sun. No pressure take. That's when no you No pressure get take. No pressure take. I like the mini gravel bar down there. You trying to distract me? It's calm here, we're going. Hello, young people. The Ice Age floods of the Pacific Northwest. Out here east of the Cascade Mountains, it's a desert. Water is scarce. But the landscape has a strong stamp of running water, and lots of it. During the Ice Age, a thick ice sheet covered much of North America, advancing and retreating in response to changing global climate. During retreats of the ice, large volumes of meltwater ponded along the ice front. And eventually those glacial lakes burst across eastern Washington, failing the ice dam up to 100 times. The most recent flood happening 14,000 years ago. In the major flood pathways, intense erosion took place. The water was traveling up to 80 miles an hour. Light-colored silty loess was easily taken away, but erosion also happened in the dark brown basalt bedrock. Downstream, there was de deposition. Downflow, the floods deposited much of its material, especially the fine grain material, depositing in the bottom of Lake Lewis, a large lake formed by Wallula Gap, a narrow gateway to the Columbia River Gorge. There was too much water to get into the gap at the same time, so the water had to slow down. Eventually, all the Ice Age flood water got through Wallula Gap, through the Columbia River Gorge, swept down into the Willamette Valley, and finally flushed all the way out to the Pacific Ocean. Rinse and repeat 100 times. The Ice Age floods, a dramatic story in the geologic history of our beloved Pacific Northwest. Rinse and repeat more than 90 times. There's still debate on how many floods there were, what the deposits mean even where the source of the water was, maybe not all from Montana. Much yet to be determined with the Ice Age flood story, a major geologic chapter in the Pacific Northwest. Why didn't you do that a half hour ago? You like that best, don't you, or do you like yours better? Oh, just, just taking my cues, man. Just taking my cues. Well, what do don't one you more. like about I love it. We're doing oh, one more. I love it. Now here we Rinse and repeat more than 90 times. There's still debate about how many floods there were and the source of the water, maybe not all coming from Montana. Ongoing research in the Ice Age flood story, one of the most impressive and profound geologic chapters of the Pacific Northwest. That's my best ending of any I've ever seen. Good. Because it's just like that the store, it's not done. Yeah, yeah. We got them both. We got it both ways. We can just 